I used to sell to Stop and Shop, which used to be the, the New England, you know, big, big ship. Now it's Walmart is the big ship, but, but a Stop and Shop is still a big store. And I talked to their buyer, who I'd sold to for many years, and I said, they wanted a lower price. And I said, you know, we can't do a lower price because what we do costs more and it's worth more. You know, you've, you've got to understand that those are, are hydroponic. They're not really organic. And he said, Dave, give me a break. If it's good enough for the USDA, it's good enough for us. Right. And there it is. <laughs> there it is. So this person who never would choose to eat organic food chooses and decides what's going to be on the shelf of hundreds of stores and hundreds of other stores are competing with them and they look at the price and everything gets ratcheted down. This is exactly what the National Organic Program was intended to protect us against in order to create an alternative and hopefully a transformative alternative to the, to the food system. Welcome to a special bonus episode of the Real Organic Podcast. Today we're sharing a fantastic behind the scenes presentation that Dave Chapman gave last week to the staff at Dan Barber's Blue Hill at Stone Barns restaurant and farm just north of New York City. We felt that the questions that Dan Barber and his team asked of Dave were so key to understanding the reasons why the Real Organic Project exists and how important our work is for the future of so many soil and pasture based farmers hanging by a thread in a system that is now pushing us out a system that we are all part of and have become too complacent with. So even if you've been with us from the beginning, this conversation takes a deeper dive into the real issues facing everyone that wants to support good food. So I want to introduce Dave Chapman to you. Uh, I want, the reason I feel very strongly about spending our entire time with Dave uh, is because I don't want you all to go through the slow learning that I went through uh, when I was most of your ages uh, and, and even beyond. And what I'm getting to is that uh, while I talk all the time about uh, real soil, uh, organic systems, we often talk about it from the perspective of flavor first and then all the other attributes that come with it. Everybody knows that you're, you have not only a very um, passionate audience, you have a very informed audience, Dave. What I, what I was late to understanding was how important Dave's understanding of organic farming is. Uh, and I wanna take just the time that we have to actually tease that out because to me, uh, it's a, it's a yawning divide between those that believe organics is the way to go and the only way to go and the only way to eat good food for the future uh, and, and the democratic way to eat for the future, which we can talk about. But what has Dave, wh with, with that kind of consciousness, why has Dave's organization, Real Organic, ballooned? And why has it become, at least to me and I think to all of you by the end of this, why has it become so imperative to dial down with more detail into what it means to being an organic farmer? Um, and that is what I've learned really from you, Dave. I mean, I, again, I wrote a book about soil, so it's not like I was new to this, but, and we've been concentrating on soil and soil functioning forever, uh, but it was really with you where something clicked into a new, a higher gear. So I, I wanted to just say that to you as a thank you because thank you've, you. you've improved my life um, <laughs> and improved my understanding of of what's possible. Dave is also the uh, person who introduced us to that great blueberry farmer that was here many months ago who we're gonna all get behind promoting because we wanna make sure that he does well this next year with his blueberry crop. Um, and, and actually it was out of that taste of the blueberry and I described it here to everybody where you, you got a sense of what real organic soil could produce from a, from a perennial like a blueberry. Uh, I mean, it was, I was, it, it, you were right. I mean, it was truly jaw dropping. I mean, it was just like, to me, it was, and I had tasted a lot of blueberries in my life, it's the best I've ever tasted. I want to just have you start off by just telling everyone what is real organic and why did you start it? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I was one of the people who, who founded the Real Organic Project and, uh, 
We began as a, as a, uh, a group of very worried farmers who saw organic as we knew it and as we understood it to be sort of dissolving in, in the popular culture. And that was really because the USDA was failing us, as sometimes happens, in their duty. And their, their duty, the National Organic Program, which the USDA reluctantly took on, was not to promote or advocate for organic, but it was to protect the integrity of organic and to ensure the transparency of the seal and to follow the law, which is the Organic Food Production Act, which is a good law. It, it did an excellent job of defining organic, which is beyond definition. And if you want a deep, deep definition, then go back to Dan's book, which I'm rereading, The Third Plate. And it's an excellent, it's an excellent exploration of what organic really means. So within that context, and it's so interesting what it means. It's, a, it's, it's not a simple one-liner, but, but one of the one-liners is that organic is not just about what's not on your food. It's not just about, yes, it doesn't have toxic poison sprayed on it. It's about how was it grown in a positive way and what is the good stuff in the food? What is it that gives nutrition? What is it that gives taste? They come together, they're, they're brother and sister. And as it turns out, there are many other connected things. It's directly connected to climate. And as I've gotten into this, I've come to see more clearly that it's directly connected to social justice and community health and, and uh, sort of our, our group welfare. In, in Denmark, the federal government is investing a large amount of money to promoting organic in the country. And it's not just for the people who buy organic. It's for all citizens because even if you choose not to eat organic, you're getting a lot of benefits. So with it, within all of that, we, a group of farmers, some of us who had been lifelong farmers, and some of us like, like Elliot Coleman, who really were the, the, the pioneers of organic in America, were seeing that we were losing it. And organic was becoming uh, industrial livestock farming, you know, production, we won't call it farming, industrial livestock, production, uh, large CAFOs, large confinement operations of, of poultry, of, of dairy, of beef, uh, hydroponic production. So Dan was talking about blueberries because I met this fantastic blueberry growers, these two growers, Hugh and Lisa from uh, Florida. And they, I went down and I, I tasted their blueberries and they're incredible. I mean, they're really delicious, right? And you go, well, I, I want that. Why can't I get it? Why aren't I? And, and you came and spoke at a symposium we had at Dartmouth, and 200 people were in the room, and they all left dedicated, committed to getting those blueberries in their stores, and they couldn't. And they couldn't, because the whole system is, is falling down for us. So even at a time where it appears that our choices in the supermarket are skyrocketing, they're actually diminishing and dwindling. And that the things that we go to the store and want to buy and are willing to pay for, for many of us we're willing to pay for it, everybody wants it, but, but many are actually able and willing to pay for it, more for it, we're, we're not able to get it at any price because it's not on the shelf. So what do you do about that? Um, and, uh, what we decided, and you know, this might be like Don Quixote, but, but we decided that, that we were gonna try and take back organic. And we knew we couldn't stop this, this corporate juggernaut that really controls the USDA. My voice against somebody who talks to Tom Vilsack every month and whose business is worth a couple billion dollars, my voice is very small, right? But. So that's not really who we're talking to. We're not trying to persuade the USDA that they've got it wrong. We tried that for years. And we, we, we finally gave it up. We didn't give it up. But we finally realized that if we wanted to get results, we were going to have to go directly to eaters and to other farmers and get together and create a dating service. And so we called it the Real Organic Project. And, and our goal was there are thousands of real organic farmers in America there are millions in the world. Only in America is, is the organic 
brand so diminished, you know, so, so tarnished. It, it, these things like hydroponics and factory farming of animals are not certifiable in the EU. That you could not get them certified. There, there are people in Holland, for example, who grow USDA certified peppers. They're hydroponic, meaning they're grown not in soil, but in something like shredded coconut husks and they're fed a liquid feed. And um, you all are astute enough to understand that that's not gonna taste as good. And it's also not gonna have the health benefits of something grown in the, in the kind of beautiful soil that you have here. The, it's not that you get sick from eating it. It's that if this is your diet day after day, year after year, the, the losses pile up and, and there are health issues that, that can accumulate. So if, if I were a hydroponic pepper grower in, in Holland, I could not sell, if I had too many peppers to send to the US and they didn't want them, I could not sell this or, as organic in the Dutch market, they would have to be sold as conventional. So only in this country, even in Mexico, hydroponic cannot be sold as organic, at least legally, right? In Canada, it can't, every country. Only in this country can that happen, but this country is the biggest market in the world. So the, the impact of this whale thrashing around on the beach is pretty huge, it's pretty dangerous. So we not only have a responsibility ourselves, we have a responsibility to the whole world organic movement to try and get this right. So what do you I do? just want to make sure we understand what it just to be is it's such a huge point, just about hydroponic alone. The investment in hydroponic in this country is arguably the number one investment in agriculture right now, right now. And what Dave is saying is that it's absolutely in antithesis to everything that we talk about and work with every day. And that's where the money is. That's where the growth is. That's where every, you talk to anybody. I, in Bejo, I told you I was in Holland, that they're, they are, are breeding seeds for soil-based farmers. You have to make that distinction now. But they're very clear that the future is in hydroponics. And they are aggressively moving because it's their business. They have to. They don't control it. They just are, are answering to it. But, but they know that the money is going to translate to the future of our of food that we eat is going to come more and more from these from these cocktails, whether they're organic or not, uh, and that is going to be our uh, our food system increasingly. And that's why the Real Organic Project is so important because it it details for you what is truly organic and what we should truly be supporting. Did you? Uh, yes. This might be kind of like a basic question, but I don't know a lot about hydroponics. Why is it so popular? Like, why do people gravitate towards that? Yeah, sure. Good question. Yeah, the the reason it's the same reason that people gravitate towards confinement livestock. Yeah, because it's profitable. So as you industrialize a process and as much as possible remove diversity and complexity and make it a simple system that you can do. You follow the the little directions. You put in this mixture. They've barely changed the mixture for conventional hydroponic in the last 40 years. And doesn't matter that that little slab of rock wool or, or coconut coir, that one, it's all the same. Whereas in the soil in the greenhouse here, well, this soil over here is a little different from that soil over there. And you have to be very careful with it and take loving care of it in order for it to thrive. And you're dealing with a living system and living systems are really complicated. So I'd say complexity is, is, is the enemy of industrial process. The whole goal of industrial process is to make it simple. And when you do, you can make it cheap. And when you make it cheap, it, to quote Hugh Kent, the blueberry grower, he said, when you build this so-called big tent and you, you allow, you permit hydroponic blueberries to be certified as organic against the law, you know, in, 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 in complete opposition to years of, of practice, you don't, you don't permit hydroponic, you mandate it. Because the cost of production just went down. And as a result, somebody like Hugh and Lisa, who are growing these delicious berries in this beautiful soil that they built, when they got there, it wasn't such beautiful soil, it had been really run down then you've mandated a system that they can't compete with. 
when you when you go to the supermarkets, so I, I I've, I'm a wholesaler. Right? <laughs> I sell these guys. I sell these are cherry tomatoes. Well, hold on, you're a farmer. I, I am. Okay, farmer. I am. Who I'm sells a farmer this, who yeah. sells yeah. who wholesales into the system. Yes, I am not a. I'm not a distributor. I just want to make that right. That's point right. I'm a farmer, yeah, yeah. right? So we have a nice little farm. It's big for what it is, but it's little. It's two and a half acre greenhouse. Beautiful, and we grow tomatoes in there. So I used to sell to Stop and Shop, which used to be the the New England, you know, big big ship. Now it's Walmart is the big ship, but but a Stop and Shop is still a big store. And I talked to their buyer who I'd sold to for many years and I said, they wanted a lower price. And I said, you know, we can't do a lower price because what we do costs more and it's worth more. You know, you've, you've got to understand that those are, are hydroponic. They're not really organic. And he said, Dave, give me a break. If it's good enough for the USDA, it's good enough for us. Right. And there it is, <laughs> there it is. So this person who never would choose to eat organic food chooses and decides what's going to be on the shelf of hundreds of stores and hundreds of other stores are competing with them and they look at the price and everything gets ratcheted down. This is exactly what the National Organic Program was intended to protect us against in order to create an alternative and hopefully a transformative alternative to the, to the food system. And can, can I push back on just a bit before yeah. everyone thinks you have wings and a halo? Yeah. Uh, let me just take a chip at you. Why, what, two and a half acres of, of just greenhouse tomatoes yeah. grown in soil. Uh, uh, where do you get your fertility? We make a lot of compost at our farm. So we have a, a big compost turner that we drag very, very slowly over these materials. Uh, some of it is conventional, but not CAFO dairy manure from a small Jersey herd that's near us. Some of it is CAFO, but certified organic hand manure from Pete and Jerry's, although we didn't get any this year. We put in some wood chips. We put in some, some wood ash from a, a power plant. So those are the kind of ingredients that we have. And that finished compost, which is beautiful and smells sweet, you want to roll around in it. That is, our, that is the heart and soul of our fertility program. And we're very intensive. So we do have high production. Right, we do produce a lot of tomatoes, so we put a lot of compost there. Um, normally, uh, once in 30 years, we've we've had a an insect problem, and that means something was off, either in our climate or our soil. But mostly, it just works. It just works, and the stuff tastes good. Great, not just good. It great. tastes great. No, I know. It's really okay, great. I can't say it. He is can it say one that. variety of tomato? No, I, I, I brought you three varieties. This is for you. I, I, that's right. I've tasted three, but do you, you're only growing three varieties in the two and a half acres. We're growing about five varieties. Yeah. And in what's the two and your half acres. dark time? I mean, when, when do you, your plants are producing from when to when? We produce year round. So we're a really unusual organic farm. We do use artificial lights to go through the winter. That's a complicated story. I'm happy to yeah. talk about it if that's what we want to talk about. That's okay. No, no. I, but that's why the halo, I just want to be careful because we I'm not tend to blow people up. But, no, but, that, but you're not a saint as, as actually what makes you so interesting and complicated and I think virtuous is that you are open about this and you're yeah. saying you're trying to make a living. You're trying to make a go of it and this is what you're doing and, in a, you, know, and, and you can justify it, but there are always questions to this kind of thing. And somebody, there should be questions. Yeah, and a purist, an annoying purist would say, well, if you're such an organic farmer, why are you using lights to grow, right? I mean, that you could hear that or you have probably I wouldn't find question. it annoying. Okay. I might agree with them. So in France, it would not be legal to even use heat in a greenhouse. And I respect that. Wait, it's not legal to use heat in, in a an organic organic greenhouse. Organic greenhouse. Is I'm that sorry. right? Yeah. I did not know. That's no right. Kidding. That's the French Jesus, standard. Jesus, I love the French. I know. Course, <laughs> course, it is warmer in France right. than it is in Vermont. Right. But yes. That's right. They don't get that. That's true. They don't get the, the cold snap that yeah. you get from the jet stream. But anyway, okay. So, so you use some heat, you use some artificial lights, yeah. and that allows you to do December through April. We well. harvest year round. Yeah. Wow. So we stagger two houses. One we just tore out this week. I'm, I'm missing a lot of work at the farm today. I seem to have planned it perfectly. So, you know, they're, they're like hauling out stems and, and stuff and, uh, and bringing in compost. 
And by a week from now, the greenhouse will be green once again with baby plants that are already growing in pots. And two weeks from now, they'll be planted in the ground. And, and you know, we'll, we'll be picking them by Christmas. So, but with the other greenhouse is, is still producing. Is it crazy for us? I, if there are questions, you should raise your hand because I have a million, but I didn't want to keep going. We also have a time constraint. But uh, is it crazy of us to when, when, when um, Oh God, I was going to say Lou. It's not Lou. Who's the blueberry farmer now that I- Oh, Hugh. Hugh, Kent. Hugh, Hugh Kent. When Hugh was here, we, I was so moved because I just, we just gotten, gotten through, you know, cases and cases of his blueberries, which I kept ordering. Uh, and so we made a promise to him that next year we're going to do this big push because he gave us some numbers that if, if things are, go well this year, he's going to have X amount left based on his orders, which, which, for him is where he's going to make the money. So he's really, I mean, you, you were the one who first told me this, but he opened up about it. He's questioning whether or not he's going to do this. Yeah. And when you taste the blueberries and you all are going to taste it when you're here in March, uh, you know, you, you'll feel as moved as I am. I'm sure you will, because there, there is nothing like it. And you, the, the idea that there's not a market for this is preposterous. And the idea that this guy would go out of business because he's not doing hydroponic is exactly why he started Real Organic. My question to you is, while real organic is is a long term sort of solution or answer or, or broadcasting power to what's wrong, do you think there's a logic based on what you've seen or what you feel a logic in us being huge proponents for Hugh in March, like broadcasting you know, through social media is what I'm really going to try and do. I just I just feel I don't know what else to do. I mean, what else can you do? Uh, like in terms of getting people to order from him, like what what would you what would your answer be? I know you have a long term answer and it's your what you started the organization started, but what Tell us if we think we're headed down the wrong path here. No. Because it's just one of many. I mean, you see, you, you're, you're like so jaded. You see this all over the place, right? You see farmers hanging, real farmers, real soil farmers, just barely hanging on. We, we, we have 1,100 farms that we now certify for real organic. So we've been around for, we're just ending our fifth year. That's pretty good for five years for a bunch of farmers who didn't know anything and didn't have any money. But, but... In that last year, we lost 100 farms that dropped their certification. Most of them went out of business. So the, this is real. The effects are real. What do we do about it? Well, I'd like to start by saving King Grow Farm, which is, there's just everything about them is right. They're really efficient. They're excellent farmers. They're really wonderful people. And, and they grow one of the best products in the world. How do we do that? is a question. So if everybody talks about it and it goes out on every social platform and every, if, if everyone goes into their supermarket and says, what do we have to do to get King Grove in here? If we do it fast enough, yes, we might save this one farm. If we save one farm, we might create a model to save a lot of farms <laughs> because people will start to ask, why are these berries better? Why are they worth more? If you buy them for mail order, they're, they're more expensive because you've yeah. got to pay for all the shipping. Right. If you get them on a store shelf, they're not that expensive. And the problem is point. He, he can't, can't get them on the store shelf. That's right. So we're starting with a big mountain in front of us, which is we're starting with a yeah. mountain. Yeah. But and the, and the first question we're going to get guaranteed, I'll pay you one hundred dollars each. <laughs> first question is what you're going. You're trying to save a farm that's elitist and it's not going to feed a lot of people. So what 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 you know, what's the good in that? And you just heard what the good is because we're, the mountain is in front of us now. They can't get in the goddamn store. So the first thing we have to do is create a, a environment where people are willing to pay more. I guarantee you, based on my experience at Whole Foods yesterday, you know, this weekend, people will pay more if it tastes good. And that blueberry, to me, it's a great place to start because everybody knows a blueberry. You know, it's like with bread. That's why I think the, 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 the Trojan horse is bread because everyone knows bread. And then you taste what real bread yeah. can taste like and, and you don't want to go back. And that it's very hard to do that with a, lot, with a whole slew of tomato is hard to do with. There's a lot of vegetables very hard to do it with. I think blueberries is one of them. I'm hanging my hat on it. Anyway, yeah. Um, given that we're trying to sort of promote these things based off of just how they taste and that there's a lot of work that goes into them, uh, it justifies the price that they're sold at. That kind of thing happens with like other commodities that you find in a grocery store, say like chocolate bars. Like, you have a Hershey bar and then you have like a ten dollar mass brothers chocolate bar. So it, like that happens in other sort of areas of the grocery store. I mean, happens? there's a there's a precedence, you mean? Right. Um, <laughs> it happens. So and um, presumably they're there because like there are people willing to buy them. What is sort of like the obstacle with? 
Yeah. Good, yeah, excellent good, question. Good question. Yeah, right. Excellent right. question, and it's actually a clear answer. So uh, until a couple of years ago, King Grove was selling all of their blueberries to, to Whole Foods. And a couple of years ago, right. a new policy came down that all blueberry purchasing must go through the global office. So you had to go and get the global buyer for Whole Foods to say, yes, we will buy your blueberries for the Southeast at that local distribution center. Now, for tomatoes, that policy doesn't exist. I, I actually deliver our tomatoes directly to the Whole Foods stores. So why would there be a policy different for blueberries from tomatoes? Well, let's, let's see if anyone can guess that one. A blueberry producer that has a lot of money made it so. That's a pretty good answer. I wonder which blueberry producer that probably is. Starts with a D, ends with an S. <laughs> I don't know that for a fact, but, but I do know that Driscoll's, by their own assertion, control 70% of the U.S. organic berry market. By their own assertion. By and their they own do not, They do not want to advertise that, so I would say it's I think that person higher. got fired yeah, yeah. <laughs> who right. said that. But my point is, that is a monopoly. You know, 30% would be a monopoly, would be, be qualify you for antitrust action. 70% means you own the market and nobody dares cross you. And so nobody crosses if Driscoll says, you know, we might cut you off if you don't do this. That, I'm just projecting, you know. <laughs> yep. I don't know, but that is the reality that, that, that you has to go to, and it's not that Whole Foods is evil, it's the same for every chain. That's right. That's right. It's a good point. It's not that the the, the seller. It's it's it, nobody's guilty. It's actually in some ways Driscoll is guilty. I mean, if you're if you're Driscoll and you're you're an executive there or you're part of the family, you know, you're like, I don't know. You're just you think you're doing organic berries better than anyone. You're doing it at a price. Now it comes back to the price example. You're doing it at a price that people can afford. More people can eat a superfood like a blueberry. I mean, there's a lot. That nobody's really that guilty, actually. And that's what makes it possible, right? Is because it's all spread, everybody. The consumer's guilty too. Consumer's allowing this to happen. Whole Foods allowing it to happen. Walmart's allowing it to happen. Driscoll's allowing it to happen. The distributor's allowing it to happen. Your politician is allowing it to happen. So nobody's allowing it to happen. It's all just happening. That, that is the sickness in all this. I cut you off. You had it. You know, it's an amazing thing. Before we had monopolies, they still grew chickens and blueberries. <laughs> and, and people ate. Yeah. And remember, the, the figure from the UN is that 70% of the people on the planet are fed from very small farms. Not five acres from or less. 78% right. of farms are five acres or less. So that's the reality. Industrial agriculture is not feeding the world, right? The world, industrial agriculture is making food for CAFOs, for confinement livestock, it's making corn for ethanol, you know, it, it, it does grow some food, it, it grows some berries and all that, but, but we shouldn't get this crazy, and this is a talking point that's been developed by some good marketing people, that we're all going to starve without industrial agriculture. That's not true. There, there, there are good laws for stopping monopoly. And you know, Michael Pollan taught me this, and I didn't get it, because I was like, well, yeah, but the price is pretty cheap. He said, you know, the, the antitrust laws had nothing to do with price. They were not to protect the consumer from high prices. They were, protect, they were there to protect the citizen from corporate malfeasance and takeover of the government. They were there to protect democracy. That's why the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed. That's fascinating, I've never heard that. That's it's so relevant, it's so important. So, and it, it, that, that basic policy, there was a memo written during the Nixon administration. It was, it was, maybe it was Reagan administration that said, you know what? As long as the consumer is protected, we don't care. So we don't care if somebody controls 30% or 50% of the market, as long as what they produce is cheap. And, and you know, cheap food is our national policy. But the question is, what are the things that we pay for when we get cheap food? because somebody's paying, right? It, it's, not, it's not that they're better at it, 
is that they're, again, Michael Pollan, cheap food is entirely propped up by uh, basically very cheap labor, taking advantage of farm workers and, and terrible animal welfare standards. And those two things together, and he left out destruction of the climate, destruction of the soil, destruction of the water. But just those two things are the things that we as a culture are willing to sacrifice in order to have cheap food. I don't mean that we personally made that decision because that's not how it worked. But there is a government policy uh, that's very active to keep food cheap because then people don't get so angry and upset. And Michael would go so far as to say, well, the cheap food is, is so that they don't get so pissed off about the low wages. Right? Well, that's his. That, that's right. He said that many times, and that's a, that is a brilliant insight. I think and you're it exactly is exactly right. It you, is. It's a trade-off. Last question for Dave. He's going to be here tonight for dinner, and then actually tomorrow morning too. Uh, I really value you as a as a farmer, and I, just from tasting your tomatoes, but just your your ability to think outside of of the ideas that, that, as I said, I thought I was pretty mature on. And I met, when did we meet, actually? When, I, when, when did we get to talking? It was just a, okay, it was a few years ago. It's not, and it's not a long time. No. I really feel enriched by the information you've given me and by the inspiration. I hope the first thing we can do to support you, besides talking about organic food and the pleasures associated with deliciousness, which is what we do all day long, is really zero in on a farmer, right? We, we got one. You're right. He's doing something that is the best product in the world. And we should hang our hat on it and see if we can make an impact there. And then maybe we'll see where we go with this and the years go on because we're running out of time. So, I, yeah. you know, that's I mean, that's your point to me. It's like it's a ticking clock. And it's like the more that we see climate change, the more that we see this investment in hydroponics and, and, and fermentation of food so that you remove the animal completely or you remove the farm completely. We really ending to a dystopian thing here. And we need people like him and many of those others in your group to to uh, to get the public aware of what's happening. Uh, and so I, I feel it's our duty. So I'm, I'm ramping you up for our March uh, broadcasting uh, thing that we got to figure out how to do. Where's Susie? Yes, yeah, Susie's going to Susie's our designer and thinks about these ways of, of crafting our messages really in a very smart way. So. Um, thank Which you. we need. Yeah, we need it. We, we're we're right. a bunch of farmers, yeah. right? Yeah. Honestly, really, you know, yeah. I, I have been a farmer all my life. I got sucked into this, whatever, eight, ten years ago. I, actually, I know where I first heard you was at Dartmouth. You were a Montgomery was, fellow. Yeah. Right. And I went and heard your talk. It was great. Oh, so, thank you, man. So, yeah, but we need help, right? And this is for all of us. It's not, it's not to take care and save the poor farmers. That is true, but that's not what I'm talking about. This is to save all of us. This is our world. This is what we do. This is how we get fed. Everything is connected to everything. So this is important. We have uh, a, a donor for you to write it. Is it a donor for Real Organic yeah. coming tonight to sit with Dave? So we got to turn up the juice and get, get the guy to, or the couple, is it a couple? Two of them. Yeah, two yeah. of them to give, give generously this year <laughs> based on our advocacy. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>